so thank you for that introduction, Dr. Ziegler. Uh, you made me sound uh, very special, uh, which I'm not so c- certain I am. And I know with this particular topic, um, I'm not sure what I'm walking into uh, because I, I feel like it's a, certainly a loaded statement uh, that you guys all have uh, some examples that you're going to throw at me uh, that I'll have to tend with. I'm going to try to head some of those off uh, with some of the examples on my own. Uh, but first, I wanted to lay down a little bit of the foundation as to what is expected. And, and all, you know, the assumption with this particular statement is that these are, you know, with the novelty of the technology, these are devices being studied under an IDE. Um, and what really should physicians be doing, sites should be doing, uh, if they come across something that is is adverse? Um, now, you could split these into two different categories. Obviously, like I said, adverse, but also, as this particular statement says, performing. Is, what is the performance that you expect versus what the actual device is doing? Let me, um, so I split the agenda up and I, I want to really get, you know, I want to hustle all the way down to these lower, uh, the clinical versus radiographic and the examples, but I, it's necessary for me to lay the foundation uh, of what adverse, you know, how, how we categorize that adverse events, what the FDA regulations are, the role of the investigator, how do you report these? Um, so I'm going to go quickly through that. I know we have 45 minutes um, to do this, 30 minutes for this presentation, and 15 for the discussion. Um, so really, you know, as we know, the main objective of any clinical trial is to assess the efficacy and safety of the intervention or device compared to something, a control of some sort. That's what the FDA likes to see. But when doing that, you expose the patient to some level of risk, and then to get or an IDE approved. Of course, you've already shown that it, some level of safety exists for that particular product through animal data, wear data, you know, bench top data, biocompatibility data, and so on. Um, so, what you know, what is an adverse event? Now, first, there's three different types of adverse events: the regular run-of-the-mill adverse event, an SAE, a serious adverse event, and unanticipated adverse device effect. Uh, some of these are grounded in reg- all of them are grounded in regulation. Some obviously uh, carry different weight than others. Um, and now this slide, while as benign as it, it is, it's also relatively important uh, because an, an AE is an unfavorable, unintended sign, abnormal lab results, symptom, disease. It's anything abnormal that you see. Now, an AE can be pretty much anything during a clinic, well, anything at any time, but during a clinical study, it can be anything from uh, a toothache, toothache to earache, toeache, uh, or something more catastrophic, obviously, associated with the device. And all of it theoretically should be captured. We see all types of studies, all types of sites handle these differently uh, and how they're, how they're intended. Now, adverse events are obviously expected. And, and this obviously impacts the performance. And these are th- four examples. I just pulled the SSED information from the FDA. And you can see uh, the adverse event rate of the investigational product. We talked, to, you guys already referenced ProDisc. You can see almost 93% adverse event rate, 85, 67, 71. Uh, you also see the controls adverse event rate. They are incredibly high. And these are these are procedures you guys do or used to do or whatever all the time. And that's the adverse event rate. And I'm sure that's not what the adverse event rate you're actually seeing. But in the perfect environment of an IDE, these are the event rates that you can expect because everything is captured. Um, so it, it's not a bad thing necessarily to have event rates that high. Now, an SAE, on the other hand, is something that has the name serious, has the word serious in it. So uh, it, it is, uh, you know, quintessentially more serious, uh, but still there is room for debate within this particular definition. Now, this definition is grounded by regulation. It's either it's led to a death, life-threatening illness or injury, uh, hospitalization or prolonged existing hospitalization, uh, disability, permanent damage. Now, the permanent damage could come into play a little bit later in the presentation or led to an ab- abnormality or birth defects. Uh, and again, these are listed in uh, 21 CFR 812.3. Uh, 
the last and third type of adverse event is an anticipated adverse event. And this is something, you know, a lot of this is obviously uh, something you everyone knows, but it's important um, that it's an adverse, serious adverse event that you did not expect. Now, part of the protocol process that we develop, we develop a, a risk analysis as, as to what risk could it be achieved throughout the study. And we really try to add just about everything to avoid anything that's unanticipated uh, by, by the device or procedure. Um, and this is also uh, a regulatory definition. Now, the classification of AEs, they have uh, various severities and causalities, mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, these are the what we put in our protocols. Uh, we run pretty much almost every total disc study out there. Uh, and this is sort of the cut and paste of what we put in there. Now, this, these aren't FDA definitions. Uh, this is our definition, but you'll see across protocol to protocol that they're all relatively similar. Uh, and then the relationship side, um, this is, you know, the causality. Some protocols, you know, eliminate maybe the possible category or the probable category, not both necessarily. Again, this is what comes from our protocol. Um, and I'm not going to read through these by any means, but um, and these aren't definitions by the FDA, but how we de define them that we found are are best for the client, the company, the manufacturer, uh, and the device itself. Now, related to both of these components regarding adverse events, we ask ourselves a lot of different questions. Um, is there is this a known reaction to this intervention or to this device? Are, are these adverse events listed in the IFU or consent or, or were these known? Were these occurring before the study? Are they related to the intervention and so on? So we, we go through this laundry list of indications and, and this is what we kind of train the sites on as well is as you're thinking about this event, how, how are you positioning this from the relatedness and from the causality uh, point of view. Now, why is FDA stressing about this? Well, it's, it's the law, it's, it's FDA regulation uh, to understand, present, monitor, uh, report adverse events, but it's also a lot of other areas that you know, really stress out uh, and want you to report this. Everything from ICH guidelines, ISO guidelines, obviously, CFR and FDA regulations. So it, it's critical that you know, everyone's reporting AEs uh, and how that relates to performance. I, I will get there in a second. Um, and, and reporting these uh, adverse events uh, obviously ensures subject safety, uh, accuracy of the outcomes, and you're signing basically an investigator agreement saying you're going to report these anyway. So you better. Um, and then AE monitoring and report, reporting, this is also guided by regulations, institutions. Uh, we've seen in the past that it can be from the VCs uh, and investors that, you know, you have to report this, the sponsor, obviously, the protocol. So it's coming from a lot of directions on the, the need and requirements to report this. So what is the role of, of you guys uh, that are involved in, in these IDs? And again, a lot of this is not going to be new to you, uh, but you have to follow Part 812. Part of that is compliance, compliance with an investigator agreement that you've signed that says you will report all of this information uh, to the appropriate authorities, whether that can be the sponsor or the client. Uh, it could be the IRB. It could be FDA. It could be all three. Uh, but you'll you'll do your part, uh, and your staff and site will do your their part. Um, and that you know, as you record these AEs, they are entered into electronic data capture system, uh, and they, depending on the type of AE, they're designated as serious or, or whatever it is, uh, and followed appropriately from there. So reporting. Uh, and I'm really flying through this. If you guys do have any questions, feel free just uh, just to chime in. A lot of this is just sort of uh, grounding uh, the next couple of sections. Um, and then reporting. Uh, now, if an AE exists prior to the procedure, then it, it's not technically an AE. Uh, so if they already had uh, that toothache prior to getting surgery and they have a toothache after, 
then that's not reported usually as an AE. Um, but everything else that comes from the time of incision to after uh, the final deadline and then post uh, final time point as you're following a patient needs to be reported uh, and will be uh, put into a database and adjudicated appropriately. The SAE reporting comes with some extra rules. These have to be uh, reported within five business days to the CRO or to the company. Uh, in other words, don't run extra. You can run extra tests, but don't wait till you get those results. Uh, don't wait until the SAE is resolved. Uh, report that as soon as uh, all the appropriate information is gathered. Um, and then, obviously, you're going to follow that SAE out until it's resolved um, or no improvement is expected. Um, and then UADEs, uh, this comes at even more uh, sensitive timing. The biggest one is this has to be reported to FDA and to IRBs no later than 10 working days. Uh, this is obviously, you know, it, it raises the echelon of, of seriousness. Um, and so we, um, 10 days is per the regulation. And then what, what are you actually documenting? Um, what is the event, seriousness, expectedness, severity, causality? All of these, you know, would be sort of commonplace outlined by the protocol investigator agreement. When did the event occur? Uh, was it right where? Was the clinical accident taken? And so on. So all of that said, um, you know, I'm about nine or 10 minutes into this. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the foundation of, of everything. And, and so, you know, when thinking about the statement of, you know, the clinical, uh, what is the responsibility if something isn't performing as you would expect? I, I split this up and, and I imagine most people in the room would split it up in the same way as what are, what are some clinical impacts that you see that you're like, oh, that is not good. Uh, the patient is in severe pain. I need to get back in there and take this thing out or, or whatever it is. Um, versus I see something on an image, the patient's dancing around, no pain whatsoever. What, what should I do? And that's more of a radiographic uh, scenario. So if you look at the clinical side of this, you know, every protocol has something very similar to this top section right here. Um, it's, you know, safety-related endpoints, secondary surgical interventions. You have revision, reoperation, removal, supplemental fixation, those kind of things. And then you also have a secondary safety endpoint where it's device-related complications. Now, this the one I pulled from for this particular protocol just singled out major device-related complications. Most have procedure related, procedure and device related complications. Um, and then this one also tacks on a, a neuro, a neurologic endpoint. Sometimes that's a secondary or a tertiary uh, endpoint that will signal a, a success or a failure. All of those are, are in the same bucket of a clinical related adverse event. Um, I'm not going to read through what a revision, removal, reoperation, but essentially, if you're going back into that patient and modifying, touching the device, doing anything to it, then it's an SSI. It's going to be a failure. Uh, it, it's you know, black and white. Um, so it, it's pretty straightforward if that's the case. Now, there is a spectrum of secondary surgeries and of a, a, AE. Um, you have your run-of-the-mill uh, catastrophic failure. And hopefully those aren't really run-of-the-mill, but you know if a device shatters, breaks, um, you know, we, we talked about the ceramic, the world of ceramics and how brittle ceramics are for hips and, and material science improved. Well, you know, it, it's not, it, those can shatter and just break apart. Uh, polyethylene, there's expulsions of uh, ferrite, uh, core, those sorts of things can can't happen or catastrophic, you got to go back in there and revise it. Uh, there's also device observation that um, device didn't necessarily break, it's just not doing what necessarily it should do uh, from a radiographic standpoint and a clinical standpoint. Like if, you know, the old nucleus replacements, they would shoot out like watermelon seeds. 
uh, some devices migrate to a point where they're impinging on a nerve or the spinal cord or subside to a point where it, the disc has collapsed or something like that where it's symptomatic. Those are obviously you know, clinical in nature. Um, then you get to another sort of different zone of a wait and see scenario. These are things you're starting to see on images, uh, radiolucencies. You see some migration, but there's no uh, symptomology towards its uh, subsidence. A bone fracture, you know, whether it's a spinous process fracture, whether it's a vertebral body fracture, uh, and then osteolysis, uh, which was a you know kind of a big topic from when I thought uh, of the uh, Dr. Blumenthal's uh, presentation. You get down to another level, uh, and these and you see these in every clinical study where the device just didn't do what it's supposed to do, or it lost its ability to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, we see this with interspinous devices a lot. They they treat maybe a stenosis that's a little too severe. Uh, it can't it can't jack up that posterior spine enough to to relieve the nerves, uh, and you don't get the pain relief. Now the, the device is doing the best it can, best it can, uh, but it's just not functioning as anticipated. There's nothing broken on it. It's just not effective. Um, and then last but not least, uh, and I'm sure there's maybe subcategories in here, the device simply is non-functional, and this is mainly for the fusion scenarios where uh, you have a good fusion um, and you want to pull those screws out, you want to pull that cervical plate out, whatever it may be, uh, because I don't, I don't know if anybody does that actually, but um, all pedicle screws and, and cervical plates are temp quote unquote, temporary devices. Uh, so I wanted to throw that one on there uh, as an example. So I, I wanted to quickly review the, the workflow that we commonly, that commonly takes place um, because then we're gonna get into, you know, the title of this slide is murkiness. Uh, and we're gonna get into some of the, the, the gray areas of AE reporting. Um, that I think will drive maybe a little bit of the conversation after this is over. But, you know, once, it, once an AE is, uh, is observed, and this can be by the investigator, it could be by physical therapist, it could be by the PA, anybody sees something going on, documents it, uh, the investigator documents the AE, uh, that AE is entered into our database or, or whoever the CRO or whatever the data uh, platform is, the CEC gets a list of those, they discuss them, they adjudicate them, both are in the database. You see where adverse events go from one severity or one causality to another, uh, and that's oftentimes presented in the marketing submission to FDA. Um, depending on what you're seeing and the frequency and the causality and all of those uh, variables, trends, analyses are looked at, you know, everything's investigated. Uh, are we seeing too much of this particular adverse event? Is it a reason to notify IRBs or FDAs or, or anybody else, uh, which I'm sure we'll, we'll go into the conversation later? And then making the decision of, is I stop the study? Should I continue the study? Uh, you know, most often that never, it never escalates to that point. It usually stops at the CEC adjudicates and it's entered into the database. But in some cases, uh, it goes beyond that. Now, the murkiness part of this, you know, when you're thinking AEs, you're thinking, okay, you're thinking along the spectrum I outlined in the slide prior, where you're going, you know, device is moving, device failed, whatever it is. But, you know, if you have an infection uh, and it's causing a reoperation to go in and clean out that infection out to the index level, I think it's, it's more of the black and white scenario. But if it's an adjacent level, you're not even touching the device. You're not even close to the device. You're not even close to what you did uh, to treat this patient's pain. Is that an AE? Um, treatment of adjacent level disease. You know, is it the device's fault? Is it the procedure fault? Is it the site's fault? Is anybody's fault that, you know, the, the uh, patient developed adjacent level disease? Now, there, there are arguments clearly that the device could have done that. Uh, but, you know, within a two-year window of that device life, is that, uh, the cause of the device, or were they already on that pathway of degeneration? Is that an AE? Epidural injections, we see a lot of those, uh, not necessarily for TDRs, 
but for other uh, other device uh, types and other indications, um, if it's at the index level, you're clearly trying to mask some pain, which would be designated as an AE. Uh, and then the level below is that a secondary surgery? Is that an adverse event? Uh, you know, usually the epidural you know trickles downstream. So level below, maybe not. A level above is that something to uh, designate this patient as a failure? And then decompression at an adjacent level. If you go in uh, and you see something and you want to decompress at an adjacent level, how does that work into the AE workflow? So, it, you know, a lot of these, you know, we have sort of internal rules of, of how we handle them. Uh, clearly, the CEC that we usually assign to these spine studies has rules. Um, but, you know, a lot of these, it's not necessarily cut and dry and the legitimate arguments for why these could be considered failures or could, could be considered AEs. There's legitimate arguments as to why these are not. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not as clear cut as, as that spectrum that I uh, presented. Now, getting to the radiographic side of this, um, you know, we have the images taken. The site documents the observations that they're seeing on these images, and, and the observations aren't necessarily disc heights and stuff. The core lab will do most of that, but you do see uh, spinous process fractures. You may see some migration, and that type of thing is documented. Um, and then those images are sent to the core lab, core lab reads them. Uh, the outcome, their outcomes are entered into the database, and then the same pathway exists as in a clinical adverse event. You look at the trends, analysis, causation, uh, whatever you think is going on, change to the protocol, training, FDA, uh, IRBs are notified. And I could even add a, a, a last bullet of uh, study stoppage. Now, we all sort of know the general role of the core lab. You know, they're, they're establishing a consistent method of analyzing and reporting these radiographic findings. Each site is going to read these things different. There's sensitivities to whether or not it's important to report a migration, uh, a fracture. Some people see the fracture, some people don't. Uh, subsidence, osteolysis, some of these other things. Um, there, there's a lack of consistency. The core lab brings in that standardization. Um, and they do, and they read everything from the, the movement type observations, the range of motion, disc high translation, and, and even more. These protocols are. are uh, really lengthy, um, but pretty much standardized for total depth. Um, and these readings overrule whatever whatever you guys are seeing or whatever the the, the tech is seeing um, at the site. Uh, but it's, it's certainly part of the story within the PMA itself or whatever the marketing submission is. Now, the issue of all of this is there's an inherent sensitization by these core labs to pretty much see what they want to see. The, the amount of sinus process fractures uh, or the amount of migration or, or whatever it may be is always going to be tremendously higher um, than what the sites are seeing. And it ends up being you know, kind of a problem sometimes, especially for our clients, uh, because it the clinical rel relevancy of those observations sometimes are artificially heightened by the FDA to mean something that's really not there. And that's why the site isn't reporting those or doesn't care about those. So, um, so we, it's something we have to contend with, with core labs. Uh, certainly, you know, I have my preferences of what core labs to use and not to use because of these uh, sensitizations that they see. Um, but in the end, the FDA is going to believe what the core lab is saying, not what the site cares about. And, you know, the radiographic uh, normal things we see, device migration, subsidence, radiolucency. So all of these are built in to the protocols as observations. Now, depending on the protocol, these can, none of these can be failures or all of them could be failures. All of them could be adverse events or none of them could be adverse events. It's depending on how that protocol is written or how the site interprets these observations in which they could become adverse events. Meaning, 
in the adverse event profile of, uh, let's say, and I'll use spinous process um, or interspinous devices, some sites report a spinous process fracture as an adverse event. Some sites don't report it as an adverse event. They just report it. So that goes down in the adverse event category as as process fracture. Um, and so it really is what the protocol says regarding these radiographic outcomes. Um, is the investigator observing this or is the core lab observing this? Um, again, the core lab is going to win out, but if the, the site isn't seeing it, that is a part of our story uh, to the FDA, that this is sensitization of the core lab, and it means nothing because the surgeon doesn't think it means anything and the patient's not feeling anything. Um, are there clinical clinical sequelae uh, associated with it? Now, now you're getting in more to the adverse event category because the patient's feeling pain, tingling, whatever it may be, based on this radiographic phenomenon. Um, has the device uh, find, you know, or finding stabilized? So if it's migrating, do you look at it three months and then you look at it six months and has it stopped moving or is it continuing to move outward? Uh, or inward, um, or is it continuing to subside? You know, is it stabilized? Um, is it a, is it procedure related? Do they have knives on these implants that are just slicing through the implant into the bone? Uh, is it procedure related? You know, what's going on uh, with the device itself? Um, and can it still function? Uh, and is it you know moving? Does the patient still have range of motion? Uh, and does the patient need to get revised? And that's the ultimate, you know, SSI, the patient's a failure, you move on uh, in, into a secondary surgery. And, and lastly, you know, what, what does this mean for the protocol uh, or the future of the study? Uh, is, it, is there going to change to the study? Is there a change to the procedure uh, or maybe a change to the device? Um, so these are, these are kind of the cut and dry, you know, device uh, observation or radiographic observations that we see. Um, now let's get into the examples. Uh, and, you know, this, this can completely be audience participation uh, because, you know, a lot of these you, you guys probably see, uh, obviously one's going to be osteolysis. Uh, and, and what do you do with that uh, over time? So first I'll, I'll take an easy, this is low hanging fruit, heterotopic ossification. I think depending on the, the TDR, the procedure, how invasive it is, how, how much you're cutting into those end plates, you're going to see some type of HO. Uh, these, are, these are the HO rates of the last, um, I don't know, two or seven or eight uh, PMAs. Uh, and you can see grade two and grade three and four, you know, that, those percentages aren't anything to sneeze at. I mean, those are, those are significant. You can see how they translate it into any clinical findings. You know, those are a lot of zeros. Uh, and there's one here, Moby C, that was a device and procedure related AE based on the HO. Um, so at this point in time, the way these are written into a protocol and way these are viewed by FDA, unless the site is calling these an adverse event, um, they're not. You know, it is reportable within the, the labeling, uh, but it's not deemed an adverse event. Now, should it be? Should it not be? You know, that, that remains to be seen. If the patient has grade three or four HO and the total disc, the intent is to maintain range of motion. Clearly, they're not maintaining range of motion if they're basically fused. So um, there, there's more than meets the eye to this particular simple observation, whether it's a safety event or not, is it more of an effectiveness event? Uh, so far, the FDA, even with rates of, you know, the 66% and 16, 19% for security, uh, is not really any significant or thought too much about these as part of the approval process. Um, I mentioned spinous process fractures a couple of times. Uh, you know, this is something the FDA is incredibly sensitive about. Uh, I think, you know, with the designs of spinous, uh, of these interspinous devices, you know, Coflex had, you know, the rail, the railing, you know, they said more interlaminar based on its placement, but really confined to the shape of the spinous process, while X-Stop 
Superion, uh, these other devices are more point contact, uh, can maybe drive spinous process fractures a little bit higher, and you see that between these two comparisons. Uh, now, were these reported as AEs? Some were, some weren't. You know, radiographically, you can see Coflex had a 8% uh, observation rate, uh, 5% AE rate. Uh, Superion had, you know, twice as much uh, observations versus AEs. Um, and then the healing component, too. Uh, so I, I'm taking these from various internal notes that I have, but all this is public uh, information. So, again, you know, this gets also to the functionality of the device, um, which is a big component of making these arguments. If you're thinking about how this device is to perform and it's broken the spinous process and can't, doesn't have a landing zone or a loading zone to rise or, or raise up the posterior spine to indirectly decompress, then is it functional? based on this event that's happened, this radiographic event. So um, how is it impacting its effectiveness is, is uh, a big component of how to assess these. Now, osteolysis, uh, I, I think this is a, a big, a, a tremendous topic. Um, and, you know, it's hard to see maybe, I don't know if it can be seen, um, look at the bigger screen on my computer. Uh, you know, the, the beginning stages of osteolysis, um, how is that going to continue to impact the stability of this device? Is that going to lead to loosening? Uh, what's the impact? Is it simply a monitoring thing? Is it something you go back in and immediately fix? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's why you guys get paid so much money to try to make those, those type of decisions. Uh, from my standpoint, it, it really is, you know, what, how, how is this advancing? Is it stabilizing? Um, the FDA is incredibly sensitive to this right now, uh, especially with M6C, um, that it, you know, it will be built into protocols moving forward. It'll be interesting to see how we trend towards causing, uh, calling these failures before there's any pain signal or anything else. Uh, so I think you know, FDA is continuing to move towards making some of these uh, some of these observations more clinical relate expected clinical uh, scenarios uh, that they'll deem failures. And, and then last but not least, this is not a TDR. It's not um, it's my process. This is a barricade uh, device uh, that is for hernia. Um, a, a you know, secondary prevention of secondary hernias, then you can see these in-plate lesions uh, into the in-plate. This is something we had to contend with in panel. Uh, we overcame it. Uh, they thought it was a lytic lesion caused by the material. I think it's a load, a loading scenario. Uh, and I, I put this table on the side. This was presented in panel where you can see you know, the larger lesions over time stabilize, if not start decreasing, and this is over five years. Um, so again, you know, something that FDA was incredibly sensitive to, rightfully so, uh, some of these were pretty massive, and you can see how many square millimeters some of these were, you know, 300, 250 uh, square millimeters into the vertebral body. Um, but they were stabilized and or they were stabilizing and we were able to show that thankfully through uh, all the data we were collecting. Again, how were these uh, designated by the protocol as failures? Um, and, and essentially they weren't, you know, they didn't predict that this would happen. They didn't know this would happen. It wasn't built into the, to the uh, protocol, but certainly is a perceived safety risk. So it really was the subject of the almost the entire panel. Uh, they lost the panel, but we were able to work with FDA on how to how to give them enough data to support an approvable submission. So those those are some of the examples, and I know we can discuss them more. Um, what if, so what if you do see something not performing as expected? And and first you got to get ahead of the problem, and this is for the science. And as for the, the company, you've got to get ahead of the problem. You can't sit back and be reactionary to this. 
Um, you got to document everything. You got to document even more. Um, report if it's a site related scenario, then report it to the company. Um, you know, I'm not saying ring every fire alarm possible, but it's got to be reported to the company. If it's one patient, or if it's the third patient in a row, or if it's the third patient out of 50, it, you know, all of those concerns should be reported. There's got to be a line of communication and transparency. And then you ask these questions. And a lot of these align with what, you know, you would ask with an AE or a radiographic observation. Uh, what does the protocol say? Uh, is that performance? You know, whether it's good or bad, consistent at your site. Uh, does it exist at other sites? Uh, is there a safety issue? Is there a potential safety issue down the road if it's moving uh, or migrating? Is it with osteolysis? Uh, you know, is there a safety issue down the road and how are you preparing for that? Is it performance device, is it the performance device related? Meaning, um, is it doing something to cause that problem? Some, you know, we talked, there was a little brief discussion about constraint versus non-constraint total death. Sometimes these non-constraint or, you know, super devices that can move all over the place put a lot of stress on the set. They put a lot of stress on uh, adjacent levels, depending on where they are in the spine. Uh, and sometimes you see some adverse observations in that area. So maybe it's the performance of the device. Uh, or maybe it's the procedure. Maybe it was put in wrong. Maybe it was put into uh, anterior to posterior or whatever it may be. And that's causing uh, the problem. And what's the next steps to ensure patient safety uh, for those that have the device already to ensure that that device is not going to cause some catastrophic failure? And what about future devices or future patients? And for the company, it's even more critical. We have, we have a lot of, well, we have clients now that are dealing with this. I'm sure you guys also uh, understand and have uh, the same concerns or maybe the same product that we're trying to deal with. And you got to understand the problem and the severity, determine the risk uh, and mitigate that risk as quickly as possible and, and create a transparent communication panel between yourselves and the company, FDA and IRBs. Um, there shouldn't be a fear of going to the FDA with this because if you have to react to their wrath uh, when they find it, then it's much harder to defend the performance of that product or, or defend the safety profile of that product. You got to get ahead of it and figure out what's going on and then present that to FDA. And what can you learn from the, all of this poor performance? Well, you know, maybe it's better patient selection, uh, patient preparation, refined indications, improved techniques uh, or approval, uh, optimized device design, or the device just simply sucks. Uh, that, that's been a scenario too that we've come across. So you know, it's better to understand a lot of this performance uh, and methods now rather than once it's released. I mean, you guys in the room have the best hands in the world. Uh, it's not performing uh, in your OR and your patients, then it's not going to perform any any place else. Uh, so getting ahead of it, understanding what's going on um, is is obviously the best best approach. So that's all I have. Um, I try to go fast. I don't know if I, how much time I left uh, for discussion, but welcome to any questions, open to you know whatever whatever complaints and questions and scenarios you guys have ready to handle. Thank you, Glenn. We do have a couple of questions. I'm just, uh, you know, thank you for the, the um, laying the groundwork as you did very, very well. And the crux of, of what I think, you know, we wanted to, to kind of tease your brain about was in the last couple of slides um, because, you know, we've all been concerned um, watching uh, some issues that kind of occur late. They sort of occur at the end, almost the exit window of the study. But hypothetically, if they were occurring earlier on, you know, uh, very early in this, you know, what is the legal, what's the moral obligation of investigators or of just the, the like, you know, surgeons in general um, when they see that happening? Does it end when they report those to the company um, and then are frustrated not seeing uh, a company take additional steps? Uh, you know, what's what's your sense, you know, wearing your regulatory hat 
both from the FDA side and from the commercial side. Yeah, and that's and that you know, I wish there was a, a simple answer to that. Um, you know, I, I tried to lay out. You know, there are various uh, colors associated with adverse events or what you guys observe uh, within a patient. Uh, it could be something that's relatively gnarly on a radiograph that you're like, oh, that's not pretty, but the patient is through the roof, you know, performing well. Um, you know, clearly, if that is something you believe is device related, that nothing went wrong, perfect patient, but device is not performing as, then yeah, in number one, in, in of equal, in of one, I would report that to the company. Um, you know, again, it's probably not something you raise a, a, a ton of, you know, think about at first, but you got to establish that transparency with the company. Now, if this is a safety issue or a potential serious safety issue, then I would make sure it's designated within the adverse event profile with the CRO um, and would obviously notify the company. Uh, if it triggers, if it's an SAE, notify the IRB. Um, and, and depending on how severe it is, I mean, the FDA has, I mean, the client has to reach out to the FDA. I mean, they're sending an annual report and things like that, but sometimes that's not quick enough. Um, depending on what, if, if you're seeing a, a serious trend with the device. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been on fire alarm scenarios where three out of the first six patients across multiple sites aren't looking too great. Now they're performing well, but what's going on? And we immediately tell them, let's work with the sites. Let's figure out what's going on. What about that patient? Did they not like, like, what about the procedure? Did they not like, like, and, and try to diagnose this as quick as possible, even if it means stopping enrollment, you know, let's stop enrollment. Um, some of that can be done informally with, in other words, not approaching the FDA, some of it needs to be FDA. We're seeing a potential safety signal. We're pausing enrollment uh, to figure this out. We'll present to you when we when we uncover what's there. Thank you, Glenn. Sorry for the hot potato. Mm -hmm. Dr. Blumenthal has a question. Yeah, hi, hi Glenn. Um, talk about how closely the FDA looks at the MOD reporting. Um, they use it, 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 it it's so severely underreported that a lot of, uh, a lot of their stats aren't necessarily believable. So certainly when we saw, um, what was the, the Medtronic, uh, agile device, if you remember that the posterior stabilization device called the fragile eventually. Uh, it started getting waves and waves of MOD reports and MDRs. Clearly, there was an issue. Every site was reporting it. Um, so that is a trigger for them to be like, all right, we need to re-regulate these, up the regulation, get clinical data, whatever it is. If there's a consistent influx of reports, re reporting osteolysis, uh, those sorts of things, they'll pick it up. They'll, they'll start an investigation based on MOD reports. Um, how overreact scenario they can be remains to be seen because now they're developing offices and individuals that are just paying attention to MOD reports versus when I was at FDA, it was something you may go to once every two or three weeks just to see what's out there. Uh, and even then, you know, that was a fraction of probably what was going on in the real world. Um, so they're, they're paying more attention to it, but they understand the limitations. Thank you. Dr. Chapman, you had a question from the internet. So great to have you here. Yeah, the question pertains to who owns an investigational device. So in general, we have a conflict that a lot of hospitals um, have policies like ours. Actually, also our hospital system has that. An explanted device that has failed goes to the hospital by policy for storage, assessment, documentation. 
In the case of IDEs, that's actually a pretty big deal, and I've not seen that actually listed out. We're part of several IDEs, so companies have always wanted to have these implants, these explants back. They say we need to look at them, we need to send them to our people. What's your guidance on uh, that rule, that conflict in general? And in an IDE, I've never seen it specified. Should that be specified? Whose implant is it? Where does it go? Yeah, that's a the great question. You know the 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 re, after revision and all of the information gathered from that device is critical to understanding the failure modes uh, and the impact on the patient and how that device can be improved. And and you're right. I think uh, most times that is not designated in the protocol. I mean, it's it should be. I think uh, the manufacturers, but we have run across you know sites and hospitals that own that product once it's explanted uh, and they do all of their own you know study of that product and it's the uh, fact of life basically i mean we couldn't get that product to analyze uh, after it was explanted so i mean it, it should be designated i don't know if that would be if so if we were if so if i developed a protocol and said you know, Acme Spine Company owns all the products. If it's if it's revised, you have to ship it back in five days, whatever it may be. Would your hospital be like, no? That would be a subject of contention. This is, again, the ownership of the device. And if the device sponsor um, who uh, bought the uh, trial, more or less bought the implants and made them available, I think they'd have a right for it. But right now, this would be a clear 100% violation of a hospital policy. They can retrieve it from the hospital yeah. and after their assessment and documentation. They photograph it, they weigh it, they uh, they do that. They they don't have any sophisticated biomechanical tests. They don't know what they're doing. They just document it, but measure it. if the sponsor it. stipulated that and the hospital refused, that would probably take you out of the contention as a site. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing, you know, we were asked because for an IDE, you have to have a U.S. address. You have to. And so a lot of the companies that are outside the U.S., you know, they'll set up a little LLC in Delaware or whatever. And, and oftentimes they ask us, can you be our sponsor for this IDE? And we're like, no, we're not going to touch this. We'll be a sponsor for a PMA or a 510K or, or whatever, but not an IDE because the sponsor, the official sponsor, takes on all the responsibility of that study and the liability associated with that study, and we're not going to touch that. Um, so it's, it's kind of the same scenario where, you know, they are the sponsor. They own the liability if that device is revised, and whatever is stipulated in that protocol for, uh, you know, a testing and after it's revised, and that should be their responsibility. Agreed. Well, thank you. We, we call this session uh, Pizza and Controversy. So uh, thanks very much for, for editing the second part of it. Really appreciate your, your being up late. Thank you very much, Glenn. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Jens, do you want to uh, just show an interesting case before we go? Uh, Ant Tony Descoliosi, everybody, who's going to speak tomorrow. Hi. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And it's a delight to be here and a delight to be together. Glenn, don't leave yet. Are you still there? Because I do have a question for you. Okay. okay. Um, this says, uh, so you mentioned core labs. Uh, could you define what a core lab is so that we all know that first? Second important question is, what do you think is going to be the role of artificial intelligence? Um, in doing the definitions of what's going on radiographically at a core lab environment? Mm -hmm. And how will the FDA deal with that? Uh, good, good questions. So the core lab one is really easy. Uh, it's, it's, you know, essentially, so for, for purposes of this particular audience and presentation, you know, I mentioned core lab, but I didn't necessarily add radiographic core lab. Uh, so it is a centralized lab that either reads radiographs or CTs, MRIs, whatever it may be. It was a radiographic core lab such that you have a standardized process of understanding. Now, this is done by two human eyes uh, and usually three reviewers doing it. Um, there can be biocompatibility labs, uh, all sorts of different core labs uh, that standardize the outcome 
or output. Um, now, the role of AI is, is a very fascinating question because, you know, as, you know, and, and Micra is right in, in the middle of a lot of the digital diagnostics that's looking at imaging uh, algorithms to predict things radiographically. Um, so I do think over time, and this is something I'm interested in, you know, I have a meeting with MMI and Raylytic both at uh, NAS next week uh, to ask them, how are they leading this in the forefront of predicting some of these outcomes that right now are using humans? Um, you know, and, and it, it's difficult because a lot of the sensitivities around these observations is what's going to happen next. Yeah. You see a device start to move what's going to happen next over the next year, two years, five years, 10 years, whatever it may be. And if someone can figure out that predicting the future, then great. You know, the, the thing is, it's, you know, the, regardless of how good algorithm and AI machine learning system you have, if it says this thing is going to fail in five years, is a surgeon going to go back in now to revise it? Or are they going to say, well, I don't know. That patient is asymptomatic, doing great. It's not ideal, but I don't think it warrants the risk of going back in at this point. So it's going to be a little bit of a battle. Good. Thank you. Yes. So we thought we'd add a little spice to the end of the day. Two quick cases. And um, this is our one of our wonderful fellows. We have four clinical spine fellows, two research fellows. Two of our clinical fellows are here tonight. The others are in other obligations. Neil Patel is sitting here. And we have Dr. D3, D. Dave Davis the third MD. I'm not making that up. So D3 is going to present two quick cases to kind of get us animated for the rest of the evening. Absolutely. Two quick cases. So uh, the first one is a 70-year-old, uh, about 70-year-old female who had significant neck pain for several years. We, she'd been previously treated for low back pain by us. And she sought many opinions uh, for uh, what turned out to be radiating C5 and C6 uh, pattern pain. She had no focal uh, deficits. She did have a positive Babinski's on the right, but no other pathologic reflexes were noted. A little bit of uh, more ambiguous history about this patient is that she was highly anxious, a very high functioning, uh, a very high functioning individual in society, very high socioeconomic class, um, and very anxious. Uh, Preoperatively, these were uh, her images. And then uh, I've included a quick look at her MRI scan, uh, which showed uh, compression mostly at the uh, four, five, and five, six level, as well as the six, seven level. Uh, to a slightly lesser degree. So without much further ado, very vague symptoms, but there's clearly some C5 or 6 ish things. Very averse to surgery. I had previously uh, done a low back surgery on this patient. Did very well, but let me just put it this way. There was a lot of angst involved. And international uh, kind of an exposure. So Europe, Israel, East Coast, West Coast, no problems. Seeing what you're seeing here, and maybe you can switch back to the flexion extension films, who would venture to say that, assuming that she'd seen literally a who's who, including in Chicago, of non-surgical care uh, for traction, for this, for that therapy, and I don't think stem cells were part of the repertoire, but just about everything else, who would think that this is a good patient for what? And maybe Dr. Geyer has been very quiet all evening long. Oh. Jens, did she have any injections? Uh, yes, she had injections. Oh, yes, she's had injections. Oh, yes, she's had injections. EMGs. Uh, I forgot the EMGs. I, I don't remember. I'm sure she had them. I think they were non-contributory. I'll stay with that. So okay. We'll just say for the, there were some neurologic symptoms. They were not totally off base, but it was kind of just C5, 6 ish and it created a lot of um, worries. And uh, since this is a well-traveled individual, a lot of consultations. Is there angst? Yes. Again, some pain relief, but agnostic and... Is, is her anxiety greater than her physical findings? Yes, <laughs> but it's, a, it's become a focus for the life. And did you do a CT scan? Uh, there is a CT scan, I know that because I, wouldn't do what I do with a neck pain, arm pain, mixed. 
Gazwan, Gazwan Hassan from Baghdad. Are you doing dynamic MRI? No. Do you think? No, no, it's the it's same price, I think, though. So, oh. So if it's the same price. In, that, in our state, they actually stopped it because our radiology enterprises charge triple. They charge the regular one, they charge an extension, they charge the flexion. I'm not making that up. Yeah, I got to teach you about it. Singapore, any thoughts? Well, the anxiety pie is scary enough. Yeah, She's scared also. <laughs> yeah, that makes two of us. <laughs> so, Scott, we bypassed you. So, are you saying it's two or, two or three level disease? Looks like three level. Because, yeah. So... This is the... So, I mean, if you're, if you're having the surgical talk, you could say, well, we can do an arm pain operation and do like endoscopic foraminotomies and say, you got neck pain, you got arthritis, you're 70 years old. Or if you want to be, you know, more aggressive, you do CT scan, see what component is bony stenosis versus disc, and then consider three-level anterior surgery, whether fusion or arthroplasty, obviously, you know our bias. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're reaching now. So it's a big reach on someone who is, makes you uncomfortable because they're so anxious, so high profile. Um, I, I just, you know, I think there's more negative than positive here, but I know you're going to show us you did something wonderful. I was actually grateful that she traveled around. I was sure that she would stick with somebody. <laughs> Gazan, you asked for the flexion extension MRI, I put you down, but now it's treatment time. No flexion extension MRI, but what, what did you do? You know, uh, I, we are all uh, concerned about, the, let's say, the psychological upsets or the stress that she, she's suffering. Uh, for, for, for me, uh, if she did uh, an injections and she got a relief, uh, might be I will ask for consultation from the psychiatry if if it's help or not. Fire you. Fire you. I know. I I, 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 I uh, let's say I start to do it in in, in Iraq. Yeah, in in Iraq and face a problem actually, but uh, better not to operate because we all know that the outcome is poor in such cases. But at the end, if I uh, try everything, I will I proceed with the fusion. A fusion. Which yeah. levels? C4 to C7? Uh, C3. So we'll go through. There's four, seven. Four, four to six. Four to six. Okay. Yep. Purveyors of disc. Uh, she comes to you. I agree with the fusion for four to six if I'm being pointed a gun at. <laughs> <laughs> no guns. Jack? Uh, I'm, I'm voting no surgery. Okay. Well, you haven't really told me, except that clinically it's five and six pain. That felt. Do we really know which nerves are causing the symptoms? It's it's a gestalt. It's this area here, and the pain diagram is the pain diagram is consistent. So it literally goes shoulder, arm, forearm. The EMG, I forgot. I'm making that up. Was not very impressive, but I think it was not there. Exam. I examine my patients pretty consistently. Yeah, the same. Uh, I, 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 personally, I don't rely on it because always the same finding in, in most of the cases. So, yeah, what did the CT show? I, uh, did you download it? I didn't I give him a lot of lead I, time. I couldn't find one. I looked for, we no, almost we have always get one. I just couldn't find yeah. it. I always get a CT. Is that bony that we're seeing on that axial there, even though it's an oblique axial? not through the, this space. This is a disc uh, osteophyte complex, but it's not all bone. It's more just a collagen collapse. Okay, well, let me at least, just for argument's sake, argue against limited fusion, because if you fuse four, five, five, six, you've got three, four above and six, seven below, already abnormal, it'll break down quickly. If you fuse four to seven, three, four looks like crap. So arthroplasty has the chance of maybe letting those discs above and below survive her life. But I would feel better if she had a diagnostic selective nerve block that gave her temporary relief. Then, also equivocal. Yeah. 
always the same story. It felt good for a while. The traction felt good. The swimming, the rehab, the shoulder muscle rehab. Very athletic person. A very, very youthful appearing. It was amazing to me. I should have made a collage of that. I think it's in the media section, actually. The number of opinions and the variety of things to be done with this simple, yeah. everyday neck was just amazing. I mean, literally, the MIS people wanted to do firm anatomies first here and there and there and there. We all had the same deck of cards and always the same kind of a wishy-washy kind of a thing. I'm going to put Dr. Patel on the hot seat. Dr. Patel, you're going to be a star surgeon in possibly the state of Texas from what I hear. What would you do? Uh, you can't send it to Dallas right now. Chan was going <laughs> to fire you. <laughs> I'll do two level arthroplasty and wait for the other levels to go uh, go bad. Okay, Ding, let's go. Right. Let me do a drum roll. We did a two level arthroplasty. So she was deadly afraid of a fusion. She was not going to a no go. I talked to her about a laminoplasty actually because I happen to like those with foraminotomies. And um, she literally went uh, Germany, Israel. I think she went to France, but not to Thierry. Uh, she went to somebody in New York, and uh, she came back then. I was very surprised she came back. And uh, I then said, we're going to do a two-level disc arthroplasty. And there was a colleague in town who's a well-known MIS surgeon who told me, I can't do that, and I got to do the 6-7 first and firm anatomy there with an endoscope. And I said, no, this is what I think is the worst level. How'd she do? Uh, she did very well. Literally, like, zero disability. But, I mean, to be concerned, now, I want to... I have this ever so often. I did this all myself. The poor fellow who helped me was almost not able to do anything. And I like the bigger discs. What did I do wrong here, Jack? I have this ever so often. Yeah, I mean, we use the, the smallest size, the five millimeter we use almost 90% of the time. So it's unusual that we would, for us to use the six, but these are sixes. Yeah, yeah, Jens has always done that. He's always done that. I know, and every year I yell at him and he doesn't listen. So you can put the five clicks. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but that's a different. If it's a smaller hyper, you got to do a better decompression. I do a beautiful but indirect. Uh, yeah. Beautiful decompression. Uh, the best. The best, sir. <laughs> Next case. Wide open. All right. <laughs> Very, yes. With unbelievably hard earth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The talking bar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. This next gentleman, this next gentleman is a current is a current patient, forty six year old male with degenerative disc disease and herniation at uh, L four and L five. He had previously been treated at an outside uh, hospital for a catch procedure for a lumbar disc arthroplasty in November of two thousand and twenty two. Um, he reported significant pain and weakness in his left ankle in June of 2023, uh, so a few months later, and underwent a unilateral lamina uh, laminotomy and foraminotomy. Uh, he's now seeking multiple opinions for inferior articular process facet fractures. The theme here is a uh, highly anxious patient. Um, <laughs> usually as the last patient in the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, that's the theme. That's that's the theme here. Uh, so this is uh, the MRI from November of 2022, uh, which would point out uh, modic changes at uh, really multiple levels, but mostly at L4-5, some uh, loss of disc height, and really not a super appreciable um, neurologic compression uh, that I can at least appreciate here. Uh, December of 2022, these were x-rays obtained after his lumbar disc arthroplasty. Um, if you wanted to be highly, highly critical, you could say it was a little bit off-center, but really I think this is a pretty reasonable... We have the world's experts here. Starts left to right. This was not done by me, and so you can just lash out at it. It was done in L.A. Well, you know, sometimes a patient in anatomy dictates where the disc is going to be. Now, we don't know what size that was. Um, it may have been a better fit if they used a medium because it's not, not centered the way we like it. It's probably okay. It's on the upper end plate that the inferior aspect of four, it's, you can see that curve on the right side of the film. And the bottom level actually looks pretty centered. And if you look at the anterior post here, it looks like, I guess it was probably a medium. So this is just funny anatomy. Sometimes you can't fight that anatomy. 
and uh, we don't have any idea what size it was. No, sir. no. Yeah. I don't think you can criticize the technical placement. Oh, I don't think you can criticize the technical placement. I think, like Rick said, the anatomy is the anatomy. Look at the coronal inferior end plate of four. It's just the way it fits. And we have data from the original FDA studies that the sweet spot is three millimeters or less. And it definitely is less than three millimeters off. So on a grade of zero being absolutely horrible, not even the disk space, to 10 being perfect, where is this? And that's good enough. That's good enough. OK. All right, Jack. Oh, yeah. There's even a little rotation there. If the patient was truly AP, that would actually look a little bit better. Hmm. But there'll be more studies coming. Yeah. But it's well within the, the um, range, as Scott said, where the outcomes are exactly the same. So only a fool would change this for a millimeter or two and risk breaking the, the channel and getting poor fixation. And one of the three of us at the table might do it, but two of the three of us here would not do it, and I would tell you not to ever change that. So, so Gazwan, you run a very successful private uh, academic practice in Baghdad. A lumbar disc arthroplasty is something that you offer? Why not? <clears throat> Actually, I don't have experience uh, on it, and still might be not believer in the to be applied in the lumbar spine. And uh, let's see tomorrow. Might might be I, I change my mind about it. I don't. Uh, uh, let's say in the cervical spine, I'm I'm a patient of M6. I, I like it, but uh, in the lumbar spine, I think that's what in the literature or what I know that. Still, it's it's not work always, but uh, honestly, I don't have uh, enough experience to to be honest. Singapore lumbar discs. Neither do I. Um, as I was mentioning, my main um, obstacle is the excess, so I'm still working on that. After tomorrow, you'll be perfect. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Wait, wait, wait! Microphone. So they, do they have a vessel injury, or that's more clips than we see with normal exposure? For some reason, I'm a magnet of uh, unhappy disc replacement patients, and, and many from my old home country of Germany. They somehow see the connection, and then they think that I can. And the things that I see, especially from Germany, are some, sometimes pretty remarkable. Uh, I've been thrilled with lumbar disc arthroplasty. I'm not getting paid by anybody to say this. I think they're phenomenal. Um, but uh, again, I agree. There was something that went on that's not immediately transparent. And as the story will unfold, the patient was very unhappy. All right. Gazon, microphone, microphone. The position of the disc is acceptable? Well, they said it's yeah. Seven, A minus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. It's the patient's anatomy. You couldn't have gotten it any further to the right, and it's fine. Okay. All right. So, uh, continues to have pain, unhappiness, March 2023. Uh, this is the patient's uh, CT scan. Uh, and on the left side, where he is having most of his symptoms, they note uh, this, uh, what was described as a spike into the uh, foramen, uh, the superior articular process. Um, and so the decision- Can you put the cursor on that sagittal at mid? Yes, right here. And so the Mickey Mouse hand, uh, is it showing up? No. Yep. Yep. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so the decision was made by the uh, initial surgeon to uh, do a posterior decompression. Let's see. All right, and so then uh, the CT scan now of August 2023 postoperatively, and uh, you may note uh, the inferior uh, <clears throat> inferior articular process fracture uh, on the left side, and I have a comparative view here uh, on CT scans from October on the left versus August on the right, where you can see um, you can notice the fracture here, uh, and then notice the fracture in October. So this patient. Uh, you know, on, on his physical exam, uh, he's, he's, like I described, he's very anxious, uh, complains of a lot of pain, complains of um, inability to live his life in any, any sort of meaningful way. Um, but he is able to extend. He doesn't have a lot of uh, what seems to be facet pain with loading. Um, <clears throat> really, his symptoms are more, are more vague and diffuse, and he has really latched on to, um, you know, this finding. He sought multiple opinions, uh, which 
if you know you can stop me, Dr. Chapman, if you want, but which have ranged from things such as a PARS repair um, to a fusion uh, to a simple excision um, to a revision decompression for the spike. Uh, so this is where the patient is today, and uh, I think it's a great discussion. Is it more back pain or more leg pain or vague? Both vague. We're in Seattle. It's a <laughs> It's, it's not, nothing simple. It's a bit of both. Uh, this is interesting to me for several reasons. So it does show that, again, I have to assume that uh, there was no discography done, but this patient um, was so anxious. I would have loved to see him before this, but uh, I just showed you a patient who was very anxious who I operated on after a lot of talking to. I cannot imagine that I wanted to operate on this patient to give him a disc replacement. This is truly one of those patients where super high functioning, very... Uh, uh, well-known large corporation um, leadership thing, but uh, talk to it, me about it, you get, about psychological pre-op. Yeah, so you you have we we've been doing that for years and years. And Andy Block, that recently retired a couple of years ago, he had a pre-surgical screening, and it was just a, a, a grid of two by two. And the if the patient was had good psychological and whatever else, they were a good candidate or they were a fair candidate or an intermediate candidate. And um, we tell the patients that they're gonna go through this screening just to make sure that you know there's no subclinical depression. We wanna maximize the results from surgery and nobody complains about it. Couple questions. So, you know, again, vague symptoms from a patient. You've got this finding that you're not really sure is causing any symptoms and what are you going to do with it anyway, except let it heal or do a... So it, I, I was the only one who said, don't do anything. Yeah. So and, I mean, honestly, if you do flexion extension films and it's a stable prosthesis... I did that. Which we had. And at, had no and at most, maybe do some facet injections, which again, you'll get an iffy response. Then you say, you know, we're not going to hit a home run. Let's just uh, leave it alone. It, it was remarkable to me to again see how people have the means to get multiple opinions, create more confusion. And again, the initial indication, we always look at images, starts here because it all, whatever happens in between here and there ends here again. And so uh, the fixation of this individual, he had a laptop full with evidence gathered of this and that, and he was looking at something and he does not need to have uh, 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 med mal litigation. He has, sufficient means, shall we say. But he just thought there was some conspiracy, something had been botched. And I've never seen this. I'm not sure that a foraminotomy here was a really good idea. I'm not sure what led to that outside of a large existential uh, crisis. Um, I'm not sure whether foraminal decompressions slash superior facet uh, um, impingement is a factor. Uh, he, uh, I put him into electromagnetic brace, um, uh, so one of those, I don't want to mention many factors, but um, he's actually, he looks way better now. And uh, we're going to have to get CTs again on him because he obviously wants to have full healing. But yet again, the other problem was that he garnered opinions from his initial surgeon, which I encouraged him to do. And again, the conflict, the differences of opinions was dramatic, but I've never seen that facet fracture. I, I think it's mechanically irrelevant. Can you talk about the holding capacity of this kind of a particular disc replacement relative to translation and instability from an inferior facet fracture, Jack? Uh, you know, I can tell you from uh, personal experience um, that in the FDA study, I committed a protocol deviation enrolling a patient for an L3-4 uh, artificial disc, this one, and intraoperatively, he had uh, parse fractures that I had missed. And even looking back, I should have seen it, but I didn't. So we were committed, and that was actually, he fell out as far as efficacy, but he was followed for safety, and I've been following him for 20 years. Um, and he's done well at an L3-4 where there's a lot of motion. So I wouldn't worry about that as far as stability goes. But a question I was going to ask is if I have no idea what the value of a spec CT is, but this guy might have showed it. <laughs> so it was yeah. So we did have a technician scan done. Uh, I did not include it. There, it does show some mild activity at this at this fracture. It was not red likely hot. It was it, not red hot. It was mild. arthroplasty. Isn't it more likely that it happened doing the foraminotomy? I think so. Yeah, I so absolutely it has think to do with the disc. And I think this happened doing the foraminotomy. Yeah. Oh, I, this is this is from March of 2023 before, and it was it was not fractured at this time. 
And, and that little speck there was nothing. If that's what he was going after, because the nerve is so, so, so far superior, it's not even touching it. Yeah. Yeah, this is, again, treating the patient's uh, phobia and everything. And uh, uh, how long until patients resolve their leg pain after disc arthroplasty? You've distracted it out. How long should we tell them? Most, we, well, we tell most of them. It usually is about 70% within three months, and then some peter on. But we have a protocol. We hit them hard with gabapentin and Alirica. We drive it up to maximum levels. We'll do selective nerve blocks. We'll do, you know, a med or dose pack early on. But fortunately... Um, you know, it, it gets better. What I've been doing more recently over the last several months is prophylactically loading them with gabapentin right after surgery. I don't know if it makes a difference, but the difference it does make, instead of them calling up and saying, oh, I have this severe pain, and you know, and you send a prescription out, it takes another half a day to get it. We just say, okay, increase it by another tablet or whatever. So... Well, there's a mechanical decision-making, and then there's a post-operative uh, smooth-talking component to these. Um, and uh, again, this is a, an aspect of motion preservation that we probably undervalue, and that's the psychological selection and preparation also. You know what? You, get, you have a much lesser chance of getting sued. You have a much lesser chance of getting sued by saying you're going to be okay than doing something ill-advised. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for our industry supporters. Tony, great to see you. Thank you for being here. Treasure. Pleasure. And uh, tomorrow morning. What time, Corey? 7.25 is the start. Boom. On the dime. Boom. Thank you. <laughs>